You think your phone or laptop shuts down when you hit power? It doesn't. Every modern device has a tiny hidden computer with its own power source, and it keeps running even when you think it's off. These chips aren't optional. They're built into pretty much every phone, laptop, and even TVs. You can't buy new hardware without them. And the wildest part is that you can't see what they do, you can't turn them off, and they can still talk to the outside world. In this video, I'm gonna show you why these secret systems exist, how they've already been hacked, and what you can do about it. I spent months digging into the details so you don't have to. And today, I'll show you why it matters and what you can actually do about it. You close your laptop, the screen goes dark. You're done for the day, right? Not exactly. There's still something running. Not sleep mode or hibernation. It's a second computer inside of yours that stays awake. It has its own processor, memory, and even its own operating system. So why would anyone build that? Let's rewind. Back in the early 2000s, managing company computers was a disaster. Laptops froze mid-meeting, people forgot passwords, and if something broke, IT had to physically show up and fix it every single time. So how did the company Intel fix that? With a hidden chip built into every machine. They called it the management engine. And this thing didn't just run when your computer was on, it stayed active whenever standby power was present, even when the main CPU was shut down. With his own firmware, network stack, and processor, it could reinstall your operating system, reset a password, or wipe a drive completely remotely. For IT departments, it was a game changer. But for everyone else, it quietly killed the idea that you could ever fully turn your machine off. Once Intel started, it didn't take long before everyone else jumped in. AMD has one that acts like a gatekeeper. If it doesn't approve your firmware, your computer won't even start. Apple has one that holds your face ID and payment keys. Even if iOS itself gets hacked, that chip is still in charge. And in most Android phones, Grimm's Trust Zone runs like a second operating system under the hood. Android doesn't control it. Android has to ask it for permission. Security researchers group these hidden systems under a name you'll hear a lot. Trusted Execution Environment, or TEE. They're basically sealed off computers inside your computer that decide what runs, what doesn't, and who gets access before you ever touch the keyboard. These aren't little add-ons, they're entire mini computers running in parallel to yours. And the most shocking part, your device literally cannot function without it. On paper, these chips are supposed to be about your safety, but here's the catch. They don't just protect, they decide. They choose what firmware boots, they enforce signed code, and they hold the keys your entire device depends on. You can't inspect them, you can't disable them, you can't bypass them. So if that hidden chip makes a decision you don't agree with, what then? What happens when the most powerful computer in your device doesn't answer to you? Your operating system doesn't boot first, it's not even second. Before anything lights up on your screen, a hidden processor already made the decisions. Who gets access, what runs, what doesn't. And this isn't just one device. This layer of invisible gatekeeping is baked into almost every machine you touch. So the real question is, who is this actually working for? Let's talk about what runs before your operating system even gets a chance. Intel's management engine, AMD's platform security processor, Apple's secure enclave, all of them wake up first. They check if your firmware is allowed to boot. If it fails the cryptographic check, that's it, you're locked out. It doesn't matter if you wrote the code yourself. And these aren't things you can just uninstall. They're soldered into the motherboard. They've got their own power, their own execution environment. Even if the main CPU is cut off, many of these chips remain powered as long as the board has standby current. And if you try to push back, good luck. These systems are locked down on purpose. If you try to flash your own firmware, you're gonna need a vendor key. If you try to break out a trust zone, your Android phone might just break. And if you wanna see how Apple Secure Enclave handles your face scan, your wallet, and your keys, you just can't. Apple doesn't release the source code and no one outside of the company can audit it. These systems are designed to be out of reach on purpose. So in the name of security, you're now a guest on your own hardware. Your laptop, your phone, your tablet, they're not single computers anymore. They're layers and stacks of machines, each one more privileged than the last. And the one that you interact with, the one that you think you own, that's the least powerful of them all. At the top is you, but underneath you've got subsystems that don't answer to you. They don't wait for your input, and they sure as hell don't need your permission. So if your device now has a second brain, what happens when that brain starts thinking on its own? Security researchers actually have a way of mapping these layers. They call them rings of privilege. At the very top, your apps live in ring three, 
Beneath that, the operating system kernel runs in ring zero with deep access to hardware. Go lower and firmware like BIOS or system management mode runs in ring two. But then there's ring three. That's where Intel's management engine and AMD's PSP live, a layer below everything you can see or control. This buried layer, the one below your operating system and firmware, that's the trusted execution environment. It's where those vendor chips actually live. They wake up before your operating system, they can override your firmware, and they keep running as long as the board has power. That's why these chips matter so much. They're not just side features. They sit deeper than anything you can touch, and every restriction or lockdown that follows is only possible because that layer three exists. You don't get to decide what your device trusts. That decision has already been made by someone else. And once a vendor has the power to deny your firmware, block your OS or revoke your access, they can just use that power for more than just security. So what happens when untrusted quietly becomes unauthorized? Take Secure Boot. On the surface, it sounds like it's protecting you, but in reality, it's protecting the vendor's ideas of what your machine should run. For example, Windows Secure Boot only accepts Microsoft signed code. If your BIOS doesn't find the right certificate, your operating system won't even launch. And what if you want to dual boot or customize or run some weird little Linux distro you compiled yourself? Too bad. If you have the wrong key, you're blocked. Try flashing your own firmware on a ThinkPad, it gets soft bricked. And if a government actor tampers with your system, don't expect an alert. These checks were not designed for you. They were designed to protect the supply chain. This is the slippery slope. It started as malware prevention. Then it was used to fight piracy. Then came regional locks. Now, some BIOSes won't even let you roll back to an older version. Apple takes it further. Replace an iPhone part with something third party and the system can refuse it, framed as safety. If you try to root your Android, some models won't boot. And with Chrome OS, verified boot is locked on by default with no opt out. And none of this is theoretical. Just a few years ago, Brazil's Supreme Court ordered Apple to allow side loading apps. Apple simply refused not because one specific chip directly blocks sideloading, but because the entire hardware stack, secure boot plus a secure enclave, made Apple's rules nearly impossible to override. And notice, you're not in that decision loop. So let's break it down. If a chip inside your device can deny your firmware, if your operating system won't load without the vendor's blessing, if your repairs get blocked at the hardware level, then what do you really own? At that point, you're using a machine that's secure against you, but not for you. And if every device you buy is enforcing someone else's policy, how long before those policies stop reflecting you at all? These hidden chips were supposed to make your devices safer, but what happens when the part of your computer you can't even see gets compromised? Let's give you a few real world examples. A few years back, researchers found a flaw in Intel's hidden chip that gave hackers almost God mode access to millions of computers. They could bypass the operating system, bypass antivirus, and take control at a level you'd never see. Even worse, this chip doesn't fully turn off. So people started asking, could someone actually hijack a laptop that looks powered down? And Intel wasn't alone. Apple's secure enclave and AMD's security chip both had their own serious flaws. And in Android phones, billions of them run on a system called TrustZone. Google's own researchers showed how bugs there let attackers jump into the secure world and grab sensitive data like fingerprint scans and DRM keys. Here's the scary part. You wouldn't know any of this was happening. These chips run underneath your operating system, invisible to you and most security tools. And because you can't remove them, you're stuck hoping that the vendor patches the hole and that they even admit that it exists in the first place. So what happens when the most trusted part of your machine is also the least inspectable? You shut your device down, unplug it, maybe even pull out the battery. And that hidden chip, it's still running. You can't remove it without killing the whole machine. So what can you actually do when the leash is baked into the hardware itself? Well, the usual defenses don't work. Most people think of the basics. Run Linux, use a VPN, encrypt your drive. And that's all good advice, but here's the catch. Those defenses live above the hidden chips. And those chips operate below the operating system in a place your tools can't even see. If the black box is compromised or just quietly enforcing vendor policy, it can spy, leak, or lock you out. And your antivirus, your firewall, and your VPN will never notice. So say you're worried about being tracked and you power your phone off. You think it makes you safe, but inside the parts are still awake. The baseband chip that talks to cell towers is still listening while TrustZone still enforces rules. On laptops, 
Some systems like Apple's T2 chip keep mic and camera controls alive even when the lid is closed. So no, you're not really offline. You're just not looking at the parts that stayed on. Here are some real ways to push back. You can't win a perfect victory, but you can take ground. Choose hardware built for user control. Laptops like Purism's Librem or MNT's Reform try to strip out or disable the hidden chips. Systems like Raptor's Talos 2 use open source hardware without the black boxes. They're kind of pricey, but they definitely prove that it's possible. You can also minimize trust. Don't put all of your eggs in one basket. Cube's OS is a great example. It splits your computer into isolated compartments. If one part is compromised, the others stay sealed off. It's like carrying multiple laptops inside one. Physically cut off what you can. Use real kill switches for Wi-Fi and mics. Flash neutralized firmware onto Intel ME if your device supports it. Some people even keep sensitive work air-gapped on machines that never touch the internet. Push for change. It's political support right to repair, and laws that demand transparency in the chips running your life. Because if the rules only come from vendors, you'll never really be in charge. So can we ever be free? Not completely. These hidden processes aren't going away, but you can carve out pockets of autonomy or spaces where you set the rules. That might mean a special purpose machine for sensitive work or just choosing tools that bleed less. The bigger fight is making sure technology answers to users, not just the companies that build it. If the user isn't the customer, who is? Your laptop, phone, even your TV. On the surface, they're yours, but look closer and you'll see something uncomfortable. Your device doesn't actually serve you. The loyalty isn't to you. Modern hardware isn't neutral, and your CPU won't run unless the vendor approves the firmware. Your bootloader refuses anything unauthorized, even if you wrote it yourself and your GPU might not even start up without the manufacturer's signature. It's not that you can't own your own machine, it's that the rules are set so you'd never truly do. And vendors love to frame this as protection. Secure boot, trusted hardware, locked environments, but protection for who? Secure boot can block malware, but it can just as easily block Linux. A safety feature can also enforce app store monopolies. A chip that verifies hardware parts can just as easily reject third-party repairs. Security isn't always about you. Sometimes it's about keeping you in line. And when the system doesn't answer to you, who does it answer to? Think about it. Laptops that silently force BIOS updates, phones that install apps remotely for your convenience, smart TVs that send back your viewing habits, whether you said yes or not. And we did a video on that a couple weeks ago. These aren't bugs, they're features. Features that serve the vendor, the advertiser, or the platform. Everyone but you. So who's really in control? If your machine can wake itself, deny your code, and report your activity, then who's the real owner? Not you. You're not the customer in this equation, you're the product. The loyalty of these hidden systems isn't to the user. It's to the supply chain, the vendor, and sometimes the state. So if the most powerful parts of your computer don't answer to you, you have to ask, who are they actually answering to?